Hi, my name's Fred Zelt. I'm a retired geologist and cyclist living in Pittsburgh. I'll be leading a venture outdoors cycling excursion on part of the Allegheny River Trail on October 16th, 2021. And the purpose of this video is to give some background on geology and, and landforms of the area, a little bit of history of the trail to the people participating in the excursion and anyone else who's interested. So let's see if I can share the screen, get this thing going. Maximize. There we go. <clears throat> the Allegheny River Trail, it's one of uh, 20 or so long rail trails in Western Pennsylvania. Um, I've cycled 20 of them that are 10 miles or longer. And uh, to be honest, this is my favorite. <laughs> I'm happy to share this with people. Um, I first cycled it during the pandemic as uh, an excursion to get away. I tried lots of new places then. And I've decided in 2021 to share some of the special places I found during the pandemic uh, to share them with other people. They're sweeping bends along the Allegheny River uh, in a valley with uh, 400 foot tall walls on the valley sides. It's just a great uh, rail trail. And the part wheel cycle on is all paved. The objective of the excursion is for everyone to be safe. Uh, also, we want to give people a chance to uh, learn more about why Western Pennsylvania is shaped the way it is and see things firsthand that relate to that and give people an opportunity to cycle on this outstanding rail trail. This outline uh, or this presentation will talk about the trail location in history, uh, step back and talk about the big picture geologic setting and then some of the local aspects of the setting too. We'll talk about paleoclimate and glaciations because glaciations have been important in shaping the landscape in this area. Um, we'll talk about some of the special features of the Allegheny Valley and how that relates to glaciations. And then finally, uh, point out some, uh, some of the interesting areas that we'll visit uh, during the excursion. <clears throat> Here's a map from the Allegheny Valley Trails folks. Uh, it's from their website. And we'll start and end and the parking area at the end of the trail in Emlinton. The parking area is past the end of Main Street. Um, you can see a picture of the end of the parking trail, start of the bike trail here, uh, and end of the parking lot, start of the bike trail here. Um, we'll cycle along the east side of the Allegheny River, we'll go through the Rockland Tunnel, have a turnaround point here. It might be about 14 miles or so of cycling. Um, at one point, we plan to park our bikes by the path here and walk up a, a dirt road, a gravel road, uh, to look at some uh, special features um, uh, next to the tributary to the Allegheny there. So it's both a, a bike excursion and a bit of a hike. Here's a terrain map of the Allegheny River Valley in this area. You can see Emlinton at the bottom where we'll start. And there's our turnaround point. Uh, a couple of some of the features of interest along the way. The valley walls are about 400 feet high here, and it's, it's just a great area with these big sweeping bends in the Allegheny River. <clears throat> it's just north of Interstate 80. And uh, you can see the exits 42 and 45 that serve Emleton from Interstate 80. A bit about the trail history or the area history. From the 1830s to 50s, there were iron furnaces scattered around, sawmills, tanneries. Uh, the river was used as transportation. After oil was successfully drilled and produced to the north in 1859, oil production in the region started and refining became important, including locally at Emlinton. Oil in Emlinton was first successfully drilled about 1867. And that's when the Allegheny Valley Railroad went through, which connected Pittsburgh with Oil City. It became part of the Pennsylvania Railroad later on, serving uh, people from Buffalo to Pittsburgh. Um, <clears throat> the Pensy opened tunnels at Brady's Bend, Rockland, and Kennerdale in eight, 1916. Um, it later became part of Conrail, uh, which was uh, abandoned north of Emlinton in 1984, south of Emlinton in 1989. And work on the Allegheny River Trail and planning for it started soon after that. And uh, as I mentioned, it's just a great trail. 
It's an important segment of the Erie to Pittsburgh Trail. The Allegheny River Trail connects with the Samuel Justice Trail in Franklin, and together they form a 32 mile rail trail uh, that's almost all paved with asphalt. And there's work currently underway connect, to connect a segment at Foxburg and Parker with uh, the southern end of the current trail at Emlinton. So work is continuing. Here's a map of railroads in Western Pennsylvania in 1871. This came from the Library of Congress. And you can see the red path of the railroads here. Uh, the inset box shows uh, as a close up of the area will be in. Uh, Emlinton is here. Um, there's uh, Rockland Station, our turnaround points over here. Here you can see the Allegheny Valley Railroad. Uh, there's no tunnel here yet. This is uh, decades before the tunnel was built. A little bit of uh, Emlinton history. <clears throat> We talked about the iron foundries in the area uh, earlier in the 1800s. As I understand it, oil was discovered in Emlinton, successfully drilled in about 1867. And in the upper left, you can see a picture of Emlinton with oil derricks. I count five derricks in this picture, kind of a square pattern, and then there's one in the distance. Um, with all the oil in the area in general, in this region, there were a number of refineries set up including one at the uh, end of Emlinton. We'll cycle past this uh, along the, the bike trail. Um, this became part of Quaker State. And then the bottom left, you can see a picture of Emlinton in 1872 with a wooden covered bridge across the Allegheny. And the undated picture in the lower right gives an idea of uh, how vital Emlinton was, a, a lively place. Here people are uh, going from the train station to the Grand Hotel in their very nice outfits. We'll step back a bit and uh, talk about the geologic setting. First, as a way of introduction, um, this is an area where I did uh, geology field work as a grad student. And geologists love desert areas because we can see the rocks. That's why I'm showing this picture. You can see the rocks. This is a gray shale. It's full of clay. It was deposited in a seaway about 90 million years ago. It's mostly clay sized particles. It's not very resistant to erosion. It forms slopes very easily. These cliffs are held up by tan layers of quartz rich sandstone. Sand is very resistant to erosion. When sandstones are well cemented and hard rock, they're especially resistant to erosion. So you get an idea of the differences in erosion of different types of rocks. And this will be an important concept as we look at the landscapes in Pennsylvania. Here's an elevation map of Pennsylvania and surrounding states. You can see the key on the upper right. Uh, the reds are higher, the greens are lower. And in between the coastal plain areas of Lake Erie and the Atlantic uh, that are green lowland areas, fairly flat, very young sediments uh, at the surface there. In between those, the landscape is really an erosional surface. Um, it has a lot to do with the geology because the rocks at the surface throughout this landscape were in the subsurface previously. Here in Western Pennsylvania, the rocks at the surface today might have been buried something like six, seven, eight thousand feet or so uh, deep, but all the rock and sediment that was once on top of them has been eroded away and it's gone off to ocean basins. Similarly, in southeastern Pennsylvania, the rocks here uh, could have been buried 30,000 feet or even deeper. They've been thrust upward by uh, uh, faulting, by compression, and then a mountain chain that was here 300 million years ago is worn down uh, to its roots, uh, exposing metamorphic rocks that were so deeply buried they've recrystallized, and igneous rocks uh, that were uh, formed by magmas that cooled slowly at depth. So very deeply buried rocks now exposed at the surface. And again, this was the root of an ancient mountain belt about 300 million years ago. It was as high as the Andes formed by continental scale compression. And in front of this highest part of the mountain belt uh, was a, probably a more tapering part of the mountain belt where there was compression of rock layers. So these are folded rock layers exposed at the surface. The ridges are uh, 
quartz rich sandstones resistant to erosion. The valleys are limestones and shales. Limestones dissolve in rainwater. The shales made up of uh, clay particles uh, mainly. They're uh, not very resistant to erosion from the valleys. You can picture this as having been formed by compression, this continental scale compression, like a, a piece of paper that you crunch up and then squish and cut with scissors. You might imagine getting this kind of shape in the layers. In front of the intensely folded part of the fold belt, which is in the Valley and Ridge uh, geographic province, in front of that is a plateau area with relatively flat lying rock layers. But here you can see a couple places where the rock layers have been folded on a big scale. This is Chestnut Ridge, that's Laurel Hill. This is the Ligonier Valley, uh, a low fold in between the two upward folds. There's Ohio Pile here is in that same low fold, low part of the fold. These ridges are held up by quartz rich sandstones that are relatively resistant to erosion. Um, and they have an amplitude, Chestnut Ridge of a thousand feet, an amplitude of uh, uh, Laurel Hill of the fold here is about a thousand feet or 2000 feet. In front of those in the plateau, the rock layers are fairly flat lying, but there still are folds with amplitudes in hundreds of feet. You can get a, an idea of hints of some of those folds if you look at the topography farther north. But the rock layers here are fairly flat lying. River drainages go in every which direction. There's not a strong preferred orientation. There's Pittsburgh. Here's the Allegheny River that goes up past uh, our excursion area. Compare that with central Pennsylvania, where there's a strong preferred orientation of drainages um, in, the, in these uh, valleys. This is a geologic map of Pennsylvania. Uh, it's a pretty detailed one. And the colors on this are different ages of rock layers from younger Permian in age, still pretty old, but Permian in age here in Greene County through to Devonian in age in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Again, here's our excursion area in uh, Southern Venango County. Cross section DD prime is shown at the bottom. It's a one-to-one -one cross section. It shows uh, interpretations of rock layers in the subsurface, each layer being a different color. And for scale, this is uh, the level of the Marcellus Shale in the plateau area. Might be eight, uh, six, seven, eight thousand feet deep, something like that. Gives you an idea of scale. There's no vertical exaggeration, so that the lateral scale and the vertical scale are the same. And here you can see uh, there are metamorphic rocks uh, recrystallized at depth. Uh, were once very deeply buried in southeastern Pennsylvania. And uh, the compression that formed the ancient mountain belt uh, that was here 300 or so million years ago uh, caused compression in front of it too. And you can see these rock layers are all uh, compressed one on another with a detachment down deep. Detachment being like a, a rug on a hardwood floor. You push the rug, uh, the rug buckles up uh, like these folds did. And again, these folds are worn down uh, the mount, whole mountain belt is worn down to its roots. That deep detachment in a weak zone of shale rises up to a shallower level of detachment underneath the plateau. And the folds there are uh, relatively small uh, compared with the ones back here in the fold belt or the Valley and Ridge province. The boundary between those two is the Allegheny Front. This is the Allegheny Front, the boundary between the plateau and the fold belt or Valley and Ridge. And it's a big uh, change in landforms across the middle of Pennsylvania at the uh, Allegheny Front. Another feature of the map here are these green areas with red. The green is sediment. Uh, after the mountain belt here had worn down a bit, uh, the assembled continent started trying to rip apart. It formed extensional basins. Uh, this is a cross section across one of them here with a fault uh, down dropping the uh, rocks here sediment poured into it. It's colored in green on this map. That extension of the crust uh, fractures related to that allowed magma to come up and crystallize as igneous rocks. Those are shown in red on the map. So these are extensional basins that post date the uh, high mountain belt as the continent tried to rip apart. There are other extensional basins along the Atlantic margin here. And others of those uh, continued extending until they formed the Atlantic Ocean Basin. So this is sort of a failed rift that goes through Pennsylvania uh, with these younger extens extensional basins. 
<clears throat> this is a close up of the uh, geologic map in the area where we'll be. There's Emlinton, you can see the Allegheny River. Our turnaround point is up here. Um, the colors here are different rock layers from younger, the Allegheny group here, including the Vanport limestone, to older, the Mississippian uh, Cuyahoga Formation and Shenango Formation. It's the Shenango Formation that's exposed at uh, Freedom Falls. Um, so older rocks, Mississippian rocks, are exposed in the uh, core of the uh, Allegheny Valley with somewhat younger rocks up on the hills. And uh, within this light green layer, the Allegheny group, is the Vanport limestone, which is important for us because the Vanport commonly on the top has uh, an iron ore layer. Um, and the limestone itself can also be used in forming iron, so, uh, or in iron furnaces. So those are both important resources. And you can see how close these outcrops of uh, Vanport were to the uh, location of uh, Rockland Furnace that we'll hear about later. <clears throat> the rocks that we'll see are Mississippian to Pennsylvanian in age, about 350 million years uh, to 300 or so, um, a long span of time and quite a long time ago. In terms of earth history though, the whole earth goes back over four and a half billion years. And there are lots of rocks in North America that are of this age range, uh, a billion years old and older. And we'll talk about some of those um, uh, very soon. We'll also uh, talk about rocks deposited by glaciers or carried by glaciers in the last two or three million years. So just the very youngest part of this time scale. And uh, these are the kinds of depositional environments that were in Western Pennsylvania around the time these uh, rocks that we'll see were deposited. Uh, mountain belt was forming off to the east, rivers uh, carrying sediment away from the mountain belt, sands, clays, and silts deposited as overbank shales and siltstones or silts in um, coastal plain areas in between rivers, peat swamps in some areas that form coals, uh, the rivers with channel sandstones uh, going into deltas with a, an inland sea to the west. And the, there would be shoreline sandstones associated with these deltas. Um, offshore, there would be uh, marine clays deposited, fine-grained rocks that turn into shales. And uh, what we'll see uh, down near the trail are uh, some offshore deltaic shales, some uh, sandstones that have maybe been shed off the fronts of deltas, some thin sandstones in this sort of environment. Those are the kinds of environments of deposition that are common for the rocks that we'll see close to the trail. Here's a generalized cross-section across Pennsylvania from west to east. And the colors this time relate to rock type, not age of rocks. The age of rocks is youngest at the top down to oldest at the bottom. It's like a geologic cross-section that way. And I've labeled rock layers that we'll talk about. Um, there's the Vanport limestone that we talked about, this Pennsylvanian limestone that has the iron ore on top. Um, there are also low grade iron ores in some of the shales in the Pennsylvanian rocks here too, that were used by uh, the foundries in the, in the region. Um, the Shenango Formation and Cuyahoga Group, uh, those are in the lower part of the Mississippian Mississippian and Pennsylvanian together are called the Carboniferous Era. Um, and the Cayuga group, uh, Cuyahoga group, that's the one uh, that's outcropped at, uh, that crops out at Freedom Falls. Uh, we talked about oil wells, also natural gas wells in the area. The reservoirs for those relatively shallow wells were these shoreline sandstones in the Upper Devonian, where there were offshore shales deposited to the west, then shoreline sandstones, and some continental deposits, some land deposits of shales and sandstones farther east. So those are the main reservoirs for the shallow oil and gas wells that might be something on the order of 1,500 feet deep, give or take, in this area. You'll also notice that uh, the Upper Devonian in this uh, part of Pennsylvania um, is a mix of rock types. There is some limestone, but lots of shale sandstones of different kinds. We'll talk about uh, Ordovician limestones that, that in central Pennsylvania were deposited on a continental margin, got to be pretty thick because of that. Um, uh, 
There are also Ordovician shales. We'll talk about the Queenston shale. Uh, it's a red shale. Uh, we'll talk about that in Ontario a little bit. And then the uh, Silurian sandstones here are shoreline sandstones. They're very quartz rich and very well cemented, and they are very resistant to erosion. We'll also talk a little bit about the Lockport group um, when we talk about uh, Niagara River area. It has a, a dolo stone that's much more resistant to erosion than, than shales. Here's a, a more generalized geologic map of Pennsylvania going from younger rocks, Permian, through older rocks, Devonian, here in the plateau, again, our excursion area. Uh, the uh, pink is uh, Ordovician age rocks, limestones and shales. Uh, this this uh, darker purple color, uh, those, that's Silurian. Those Silurian sandstones that are so resistant to erosion are uh, in that. Um, and uh, uh, the next image, the next slide is gonna be a satellite image and we're gonna focus in on this area in Southern Bedford County, talk about the geology there and the landforms. Notice that there's Ordovician in this part of the, of the box, Silurian on either side, and then that's flanked by Devonian outside of that. So this is a fold that's eroded through its core. So there are older rocks in the center and younger rocks on either flank. Here's that satellite image, a big part of Pennsylvania and surrounding states, and then zooming into Southern Bedford County where there's Ordovician limestone uh, at the surface forms soil that's great for agriculture, wall-to-wall -wall farms growing crops, excellent for agriculture. The limestone uh, calcium carbonate forms a natural buffer. Uh, it buffers uh, the, the uh, acidic soils that would be created uh, by decaying plant material without this sort of buffer um, and uh, allows uh, plants to thrive that, that uh, don't love uh, acidic soils. On the side of the valley, here is Silurian sandstone holding up a high ridge, resistant to erosion. And then outside of that to the east, you can see a, a mix of land use here. There are some farms, but also woodlands. This is where Devonian shales, limestones, and sandstones are at the surface. And the soils here aren't as amenable to farming as in the Ordovician limestone. And obviously the Silurian sandstone soils on top of that, uh, it's rocky, there are thin soils. So it's uh, more suited for forest. On the other side of this broad fold, there's a, a repeat of the Silurian sandstone, and then the next younger layers, uh, the, the Devonian here. And you can see that the land use here is very similar to the land use on this side of the fold. Now that you're clued in to the land use, the landforms, and the geology, if you look a little more closely at the satellite image of Pennsylvania, I think you'll be able to pick out the valleys uh, where there's wall-to-wall -wall crop uh, growing in wall-to-wall uh, -wall farms, uh, where there's this Ordovician limestone at the surface forming excellent soils. Um, and then these ridges, uh, high ridges that are formed by uh, resistant Silurian sandstone layers. Next, we'll uh, take a look at uh, Emlinton here, and uh, we'll zoom in on what uh, a... Uh, satellite image looks like in the area where we'll be. So here's that area. Um, up on the high areas where it's flat, there is agriculture, uh, perhaps not as rich soils as the Ordovician limestone-based soils in central Pennsylvania, a mix of agriculture and, and woodland areas. Um, and then you can see the, the deep valley here uh, of the Allegheny River with Emlinton. And again, our turnaround point will be up here. So the, not only the form of the land, the shape of the land, but the use of the land has everything to do with the geology, the underlying rocks. Now we're going to talk just briefly about paleoclimate and we'll talk about glaciations because the glaciations here have been really important in shaping the details of the landforms. When People talk about climate, sometimes they talk about this data set. Uh, they're only talking about the last 140 years. Um, this is a chart that gets updated every year, early in the year, research institutions. Uh, there are three here shown in the US, one in the UK. They make an average 
uh, estimated annual temperature uh, for uh, the prior year, and they publicized that. So in recent years, it's normal to hear that this has been the hottest year on record or second hottest year on record. But really what they're talking about is in the last 140 years, not all through Earth history. Now, there has been a significant rise in global temperatures since about the 1970s. And you can see that very clearly on this plot. But again, often when people are talking about the hottest period ever, they're really talking about uh, this global thermometer based uh, temperature data set that goes back to 1880. So the last 140 years, not all of Earth's Earth history. This is a look farther back in time, much farther back. And this isn't based on global thermometer <laughs> temperature measurements, obviously, uh, because this goes back 500 million years in the upper chart. Instead, it's based on a proxy of temperature, oxygen, stable oxygen isotopes. Um, oxygen isotopes are a good indicator of, of uh, temperature. Um, I can go into this uh, another time if you like. I have a whole talk about climate I'm happy to give. Uh, there's really not time in this talk to go into the details, but the uh, oxygen isotopes are used as a proxy for temperature. So degrees C uh, from the proxy is on the vertical axis. You can see the divisions are two degrees C. Degrees Fahrenheit on the vertical axis on the right, the divisions are five degrees Fahrenheit. And then time going back in time from today, uh, from right to left. First in 5,000 year increments, then 200,000 year increments, million year increments, 10 million year increments, 100 million year increments. As we go back farther in time, the, the uh, exact ages of things become less precise. So it's appropriate for the um, plot to become more fuzzy and uh, have less detail in it. It's not that the details didn't happen then, it's just that we can't be as confident in uh, dating them precisely. The youngest part of this with the blue line uh, or lines, uh, those temperatures are based on um, water, uh, oxygen and water recovered from cores of ice uh, drilled down deep into uh, glaciers in Greenland and Antarctica. And it's very confident, uh, uh, the nature of this, the data there is very confident. The rest of the data, uh, the dark lines and colored lines that are older are from the same kind of thing, oxygen isotopes, but instead they're from marine fossils, from the shells of marine fossils. And you can see that the marine fossils in the ice cores show exactly the same thing where they overlap. So we have confidence uh, that these marine fossils are giving us a, a reasonably good indication of uh, relative variations in temperature in the past. So today we're in an interglacial period. There are continental scale glaciers in Greenland and Antarctica, but they're not nearly, the glaciers are not nearly as extensive as they were 20,000 years ago during the last glacial maximum uh, when glaciers came down into Pennsylvania and uh, were very thick in, in Canada. Um, there, uh, with the change in time scale here, uh, these are other interglacial periods like the one we're in now. In fact, this one is about 20,000, or uh, sorry, about 12,000 years long, uh, similar to the, uh, interglacial period that we're in now, um, but they look a lot different because of the time scale is much compressed. These are 100,000 year cycles. Um, they're caused by uh, uh, variation in Earth's orbit around the sun that has a periodicity of 100,000 years. That periodicity changes to about 41,000 years, about a million years ago. That's what was controlling these glacial interglacial cycles that far back in time. Uh, so they're natural cycles. They've been happening. These uh, uh, solar uh, cycles of Earth's orbit around the sun have been happening all through Earth history. And here you can see they've controlled the uh, interglacial and glacial uh, uh, variations uh, uh, that have gone back and forth uh, many times in the last two or three million years. In the closer view here, um, there's also a big change in sea level going between a glacial period and an interglacial period. And the most recent glacial period, uh, 20,000 years ago or so, sea level was about 120 meters uh, lower than today. So 
that kind of sea level change, 100 meters or more, uh, surely has happened through these other glacial cycles in the past too. Um, when uh, sea level uh, is low here, it's because a lot of water is locked up in those big thick glaciers. So these are this is like a sea level curve also um, in the last couple million years. I'll just point out that if you go way back in time, 300 or so million years ago, there was another glaciation. There were a couple others too in Earth history, but this is a period of, of continental scale glaciers also. And it's a time when global temperature was relatively low, kind of like it's been the last million years or so. Uh, this is not a plot of CO2, but a plot of uh, an estimated CO2 concentration in the atmosphere from proxies it has a similar shape. So this is another time when CO2 was relatively low, like it generally is now. Although, of course, CO2 has been rising uh, quite uh, remarkably um, in the last 100 or 200 years. In fact, CO2 hasn't been as high as it is now for about 3 million years. But again, that's another chart, something to talk about if we talk about halo climate another day. To give you an idea of what the uh, continental scale glaciation might have looked like, here's a, a relatively recent publication where they've tried to estimate the thickness of glacial ice in North America and Greenland uh, based on how much the crust has rebounded since the uh, glaciers melted. Um, thick ice weighs down the crust, and then when it melts, the crust rebounds. And uh, their estimate uh, from their models suggests that uh, this continental scale glacier might have been something like a thousand meters thick at the southern shore of Lake Erie. So three, more than 3,000 feet thick there. So these are quite thick glaciers, and they would serve well to uh, block up any previous river drainages that were heading to the north before the glaciations. This map shows uh, the directions that the glaciers flowed in northern Pennsylvania and adjacent areas. Um, snow was falling in Canada, adding to the ice. The ice slowly uh, flowed to the south. And the landforms and uh, grooves carved into the land by uh, rocks carried at the bottom of glaciers, those sorts of things uh, are used to indicate the direction of flow. And, and those are indicated by arrows here. And our area uh, is, is about here. So you can imagine bits of rock being picked up in Canada and uh, north, of, north of Pennsylvania, bits of rock picked up by the glaciers carried along the bottoms of them, uh, maybe within the glaciers. And then the glaciers melt at the snout. And uh, that's, uh, there would be a pile of glacier carried rock there and glacier carried rock underneath the glaciers all through these areas too. Uh, those uh, rocks or sediments that are underneath the glaciers carried by the glaciers, those glacial deposits have a special name called till, and we'll talk about till later on. But this gives you an idea of the direction of flow uh, that rocks might have followed as they were carried by glaciers down into Pennsylvania. And here's a geologic map of uh, the Great Lakes region Again, there's our excursion area. The white line is the extent of uh, glaciations. Um, the outline of Pennsylvania is in gray here. Carboniferous rocks, uh, Pennsylvanian and Mississippian are shown in gray. Devonian rocks in blue. Silurian are older rocks, and then Ordovician older than that. And then here at this boundary, uh, north of uh, Lake Huron um, in Ontario, Canada, you can see a big change in the geology. The rock units at the surface here are all metamorphic rocks that have been really deeply buried so that they're recrystallized, or they're crystalline um, igneous rocks, magmas that were cooled deep in the crust and made visible crystals, large crystals. Um, so those were deeply buried rocks now at the surface. And they're also a lot older than the sedimentary rock cover on top of them, which is uh, this part of the map, is the sedimentary rock cover. You can see these Precambrian rocks, GA is billions of years. They're about a billion years or so old in the Adirondacks, uh, going into Canada here, over a billion years old. And then uh, to the west of this line, more than two and a half billion years old, some very old continental crust in this area. And I'm mentioning this because uh, 
glaciers carrying rocks down into Pennsylvania, the closest uh, that they could pick up uh, igneous and metamorphic rocks and carry them down into Pennsylvania, the closest they could get them is up here. And we'll find lots of those if we're able to uh, uh, look at river cobbles uh, in the Allegheny River uh, from cobbles that were uh, picked up by glaciers in Canada, dragged down uh, by glaciers into the Allegheny River drainage, and then washed into the river and deposited uh, along the river. So we'll see high-grade metamorphic rocks and igneous rocks uh, in Pennsylvania that came from Canada in this way. I mentioned uh, a little bit about Silurian rocks uh, that are resistant to erosion, Ordovician rocks that have shale. Uh, the shapes of the Great Lakes here have everything to do with the glaciers scouring out relatively weak rock layers. Um, Lake Erie is underlain by Upper Devonian marine shales. These clay-rich rocks were easy for the glacier to scour out and create a lake basin. The same rock layer is around this part uh, of the Great Lakes. So Lake Michigan and, and Lake Huron were scoured out in the same way. Uh, Lake Ontario, there's a weak Ordovician shale layer that was scoured out here. And in between those is a, a, a Silurian dolostone that's especially resistant to erosion. It forms what's called the Niagara Escarpment. This is the Niagara River. It flows from Buffalo into uh, Lake Ontario. And the river drops over Niagara Falls about here uh, that dolostone uh, holds up the waterfall. The um, shales that are weak uh, form the plunge pool underneath the waterfall. It's that change in rock type that allows the waterfall to be there. And that Silurian escarpment, those resistant rock layers, you can see how they define the peninsulas and islands uh, all through this part of the Great Lakes region. So people even over in Michigan talk about the Niagara escarpment. It's such an important part of the landscape. I didn't talk about Lake Superior. Uh, there are Precambrian rocks there too, but this was a rift, a much older rift than the one we talked about in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, the continent in the Precambrian started to try to rip apart. There were sediments uh, that poured into the rift basins. Um, there were uh, igneous rocks that were intruded along the margins. The igneous rocks are relatively tough to erode. The sedimentary rocks have been metamorphosed, but they're still easier for glaciers to erode. And that's why Lake Superior has the shape it has, because it's the outline of a Precambrian rift basin. So there you get to see um, the reason for the shapes of the Great Lakes. OK, glacial deposits in Pennsylvania are shown in this map. Um, we're going to zoom in on the red box in a second. But in general, you can see that there are deposits from underneath glaciers, both in northeastern Pennsylvania and in northwestern Pennsylvania. And the yellow are water-washed glacial deposits carried by water. Um, some of those, for example, in the uh, Susquehanna River drainage were carried far away from the area underneath glaciers, but they're still glacial age sediments and sediments related to glaciers. So the yellows are water-washed glacial deposits. And here's a close-up of Venango County, the area of our cycling excursion. The uh, deposits that can confidently, confidently be identified as uh, being from below glaciers, these tills, are in these solid colors. The oldest of those layers in brown, middle of age here, and the youngest ones uh, from uh, perhaps the youngest glaciations uh, some as young as 20,000 years ago, the most recent glaci glaciation are in blue. Uh, the yellows are water washed sediment carried by water. And the um, dashed line here is uh, an interpreted limit of glacial advance and it's approximate. Uh, there may be uh, boulders of granite that came from Canada were carried down by glaciers and left behind within that area, but there aren't clear till deposits there. So glaciers may have come as far as the dashed line at some time in the last two or three million years. Now we'll look at some of the special features of the Allegheny River Valley, especially as they relate to these glaciations. And to do that, I'm first going to uh, show you an analog uh, from uh, the Wisconsin River and Mississippi River 
Um, this area is just west of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, the current Wisconsin River flows from east to west, and the Mississippi River flows from north to south. Here they, they join. Just uh, the nature of the landforms here gives evidence uh, that once the uh, Wisconsin River didn't flow east to west, instead that it used to flow west to east. One form of evidence is inside the white rectangles, there are river terraces. So these are uh, relatively flat areas with some river uh, born sediment on top of them, rounded rocks on top of them. Uh, and uh, uh, the levels of those terraces, each of those terraces drops down from west to east, suggesting that this river and the bottom of the river uh, dropped down west to east. So the river flowed from west to east when those terraces were formed. Also, you can see the tributaries to the Wisconsin River shown in blue. And uh, they're, the way they're angled suggests that the river flowed from west to east also. Um, there's a curved edge to the highlands here uh, with a terrace below it from that old trace of the rivers. And it looks like the Mississippi River made a, a curve here uh, and flowed down the course of the Wisconsin River in this area. I'll also point out that the Wisconsin River Valley is wider here than it is there, uh, which is consistent with this being uh, potentially being downstream originally. Another feature of this map is uh, shown by the area uh, pointed, pointed out with the yellow arrows. Um, today, the Mississippi River flows in this direction. And you'll notice that the Mississippi River Valley is wider to the north of this junction with this Wisconsin River than it is immediately south. This is thought to have been a drainage divide. This was an upland high area when the Mississippi River flowed in this direction uh, along the Wisconsin River originally. But then when the river uh, reversed course and cut through this area, it cut a relatively narrow uh, valley. It's narrower than the valley up here. So this is a, a feature that we'll look at in Pennsylvania associated with drainage divides between previous, a previous ancient drainage and then a newer river that cuts across that drainage divide. Each of these are features we'll talk about in Pennsylvania. And this uh, uh, reversal of drainage is thought to have had the same sort of cause as uh, the changes in drainage in Pennsylvania, that glaciers came from the north, plugged up uh, the previous drainage, which was to the east and north, so that the river was then forced to drain in another direction. Uh, a lake is actually thought to have formed here, similar to what we'll see in Pennsylvania, that, that would have spilled over here and then eroded out a new channel and taken away the drainage and reversed the course of this river. So it's a very similar story to what we'll see in Pennsylvania, but I wanted to show this example because so many of the features are shown in a relatively small area. Here's a uh, map area of uh, Western Pennsylvania and adjacent states. And this is based on concepts that have been around for over a hundred years. It's thought that before, before glaciers came, uh, there was an upper, a middle, and a lower Allegheny River. And that actually the Monongahela River drained along with uh, what's now the upper Ohio drained uh, through the Beaver Valley up to the north. Uh, there were drainage divides between these rivers. Here you can see a drainage divide north of the Clarion River, north of Parker, along the Allegheny, and another drainage divide uh, to the west of Warren and a drainage divide to the east of Warren. And we'll show this area in a modern map in some detail. So I wanted to point out those drainage divides. Now the evidence that these rivers were flowing in this direction and then uh, changed course when glaciers came and didn't allow the rivers to flow north, forced the rivers to, draw, uh, to flow south. Some of the evidence for these is the same sort of evidence we talked about with the Wisconsin River. Uh, looking at the intersections of tributaries, which should point downstream, um, looking for narrow places in river valleys that could have been a previous drainage divide uh, that doesn't have terraces, 
looking at terraces where the valleys or river valleys are wider and looking at the elevations of those terraces to give an indication of which way the river was flowing when those terraces were formed. All those forms of evidence went into these maps uh, and the interpreted uh, ancient drainage pattern. So you can see that uh, where we'll be uh, uh, cycling is right around one of these drainage divides. And we will look at um, a closer view of uh, topography in, in that area. First, here's a, an idea, a map of uh, what a lake would, could have looked like when the glaciers came along and plugged up that drainage to the north. It's called uh, Lake Monongahela. Um, the spill point for this was uh, down here in West Virginia, New Martinsville, West Virginia. It's thought to have had a spill elevation of 1,100 feet. So this lake is thought to have filled up to an elevation of 1,100 feet, uh, which is kind of close to the top of Mount Washington in Pittsburgh. Um, the lake uh, extended so far to the east, it went up the Yokogany River Valley and uh, into Ohio Pile State Park. And uh, a, a professor at Lehigh University, uh, Frank Pazaglia and his students have been studying the glacial deposits there, uh, the river terraces from glacial times, I should say. And they found evidence, uh, they found deposits from uh, this Lake Monongahela within the park uh, in the Yokogany River Valley. And they've done some age dating of those. And their estimate, uh, which is just, just uh, uh, published in a um, field trip guidebook uh, uh, here in October, 2021, their uh, age date for that uh, lake deposit was about 1.8 million years ago. That's consistent with uh, the age of major river drainage reorientations uh, from farther south, a similar age. So it gives us some idea that there may have been a, a major reorientation of these river drainages about 1.8 million years ago. This is uh, uh, oxygen isotopes indicating temperature changes, just like the chart we saw before. This is a little more generalized. And this time, the time scale doesn't change. It's a linear time scale along the bottom. Uh, it's in millions of years. There's 1 million years ago. Uh, there's today. We're in an interglacial period right now. 100,000 year cycles here, 41,000 year climate cycles there for reasons that I mentioned before. So here's 1.8 million years ago, about the age of Lake Monongahela. There are something like 30 or more glacial and interglacial periods uh, since then, uh, between 1.8 million years ago and now. So surely the glacial history of uh, North America, of Northern Pennsylvania is very complicated. That's probably not a simple history there may have been uh, ice dams to the north uh, more than just once <laughs> that caused uh, effects in the drainages, in the river drainages. And remember, sea levels going up and down more than 300 feet during these glacial interglacial cycles, and maybe hundreds of feet at these times too. And those changes in sea level work their way up the river systems. When sea level drops, there's a lot of erosion all the way up the river systems. And then when there's sea level rises, there's a lot of deposition of sediment. So um, these uh, glacial interglacial periods and the sea level rises and falls associated with them are uh, very complicated <laughs> in the last couple million years. And so probably the glacial history is uh, very complicated too. And that's good to, to keep in mind as, as we tend to talk about things in a more simplistic way. I uh, promised to show you a closer look at uh, drainages uh, around where we'll be. And here's our chance to do that. There's Emlinton, there's Parker. Uh, uh, there's uh, the interpreted drainage divide uh, along the path that will cycle. Um, the the uh, arrows on this indicate uh, river drainage direction. And the arrows, are all in the current direction of river drainage. But for the blue arrows, it's thought that in the past, the river uh, actually drained uh, in a different direction than today. So uh, for example, 
here where we'll be uh, along this part of the uh, Allegheny River. Uh, it's thought that uh, from, from the Clarion River down, uh, here where there are a wide valley with lots of perched river terraces, the river, old river went through this area, depositing those now high perched terraces, that this drainage was to the south, just as it is today. But it's thought that uh, in this area where tributaries form Vs pointing to the north, that the original drainage was to the north and that there was a drainage divide between the two of those. And when the drainage was reorganized, reoriented because of glaciers plugging up the drainage to the north, the Allegheny River cut through this area where the um, valley is relatively narrow. Uh, same kind of thing uh, around here. Um, there's Titusville. Right now, today, the river's uh, streams float and join at Titusville, uh, go through uh, Oil Creek. This is uh, Oil Creek State Park uh, down to Oil City, join the Allegheny River down there. But it's thought that in the past, this drainage was in the other direction to the north, that actually these streams uh, went to the north. You can see these tributaries joining at, at an angle and that there was a drainage divide here. And this drainage divide that's been cut through now uh, is a relatively narrow stream valley. It's very scenic in Oil Creek State Park. Similarly, here's Warren. And remember I showed you the map that had drainage divides on either side. Um, so today, the, the uh, Allegheny River flows down from New York State um, in, in this direction, and then down in this direction. But it's thought that in the past, uh, this was one river system. You can see the tributaries joining, forming Vs that point to the north, that this was a north draining, a north directed river system. Same with this, that this was a north directed river system, and this was a tributary to it. So that when the Allegheny River was reorganized, it cut through upland areas in these two spots, in these two drainage divides. And those are, again, relatively narrow parts of the Allegheny River Valley. In fact, this narrow part of the Allegheny River Valley is, uh, was used for Kinzu Dam. Kinzu Dam dams the narrow part of the valley, and then the reservoir floods the wider part of this older valley in this area. So the blue arrows here indicate where the drainage direction is interpreted to have uh, reversed. Uh, that today it, it's going in this direction, but the previously the drainage went in the opposite directions. So uh, I think that's part of why uh, I really like this part of the Allegheny River Trail because it's a relatively narrow part of the valley and now you can see the interpretation of why that is, because it was a drainage divide between older previous uh, Allegheny River systems that have since been amalgamated. Here's a, another look at elevation in the general area. There's uh, Emlinton, Rockland, and our turnaround point. The interpreted drainage divide as interpreted by a geologist in the early 1900s, but this whole area uh, probably was a highland area has a relatively narrow uh, river valley with uh, 400 foot tall sides. Compare that with the area around Parker and where the Allegheny River Valley is, is much wider and along the Killarian River too. So this is that interpreted old drainage system uh, that drained to the south in the lower Allegheny River that since then got amalgamated with the middle and upper uh, Allegheny Rivers uh, through this area. And we'll come back and talk about this feature around Parker in some detail a bit later. But for, and first, uh, before we do that, I wanna show another analog. Here's the modern Mississippi River at Memphis. The river itself is brown in the satellite image, but you can see places where clearly the river once um, flowed in the past um, and now uh, it's been cut off and abandoned. And you can see lots of those now that your eye is keyed in. So here's an example of analogs that we might use to look for similar patterns in much older river systems in the geologic past. Another type of analog we might use is a physical model. Here's a stream table, a sand uh, table model of a river. You can see the river channel that is it's cut down through the sand 
uh, the most recent river channels down deep here, but it's left behind some benches where the river used to run, uh, but it's left those as perched abandoned uh, benches up high or terraces up high. Now we'll use those concepts to look again at the elevation map around Parker. Um, here you can see a really nice bend in a flat area that's way above the elevation of the current Allegheny River. It's a perched terrace with this curve bend. You can see some other nice curves here that surely were cut by the Allegheny River at some point in the distant past, maybe something like 1.8 million years ago before the river systems here were highly reorganized and cut a lot deeper. Um, this hasn't been directly dated yet, uh, but that gives an idea of what uh, the potential age of this could possibly be. We'll look a little bit even closer, and here you can see that uh, interpreted old river bend of the Allegheny. And then as the river uh, cut down, um, tributaries have started to incise into that uh, terrace, into these other terraces. So these are much younger incisions into that. And we'll look at uh, an outcrop, uh, some rocks from an outcrop that's right here, right in the middle of this terrace uh, where the bottom of the river may have flowed at one time. And we'll look, look at a couple other spots uh, where there are rocks at the surface or sediment at the surface on these terraces. And here you can see uh, the rocks I uh, promised. There are river rounded cobbles and small boulders and pebbles. Most of them are sandstone, local, locally derived, but some of them like this one are granite from Canada. It, could, it has to have come from Canada. There's no outcrop of granite between here and there. Um, so uh, carried down by glaciers, washed into the river, and then deposited on the bottom of the river when the Allegheny River uh, used to flow here 220 feet above current river level. Now this is uh, called the Parker Strath. The Strath specifically refers to the bedrock that's just below, below these uh, river deposits. There's solid old bedrock underneath. And uh, that's part of uh, an indication that the river flowed here, that it, it cut these bedrock terraces with uh, river sediments on top. So the Parker Strath is pretty famous. It was described uh, more than 100 years ago. And people talk about the Parker Strath when they talk about a prominent terrace level as far down the Ohio River system as uh, Kentucky. So geologists in Ohio, West Virginia, and Kentucky talk about the Parker Strath. This strath and these deposits are of regional geologic significance. There are a lot of other uh, river terraces, perch terraces along the Allegheny River system, the Nongahela, the Ohio. Um, not gonna talk about all of them. I'll just mention Natrona Heights uh, is a very nice flat topped river terrace. It even slopes downstream a little bit from sloping down from north to south. Um, this is one of the neatest ones though. Surely the Monongahela River here near Pittsburgh at one time carved this valley. Uh, and so we might look for river deposits on this flat terrace. These river terraces around Pittsburgh are one of the reasons why there's as much flat ground as there is. Otherwise, uh, you know, things would be very much more hilly. A closer look, this time with a different color scale so that this flat terrace is uh, green in terms of elevations and colors. Um, it extends from Oakland through East Liberty. When you're in East Liberty, you can see how very flat it is. You can imagine that being the bottom of the ancient Monongahela River uh, through Wilkinsburg uh, and, and then uh, down to Swissvale. And these streams have incised into these uh, terrace deposits. And we'll look at uh, Fern Hollow, one of these streams that's cut into the terrace. We'll look at the river terrace deposit from the top of Fern Hollow. So here it is, uh, the location shown in the last map. And when you're looking at geology, looking at uh, sediment deposits in urban areas, uh, sediment that's not consolidated, you really have to worry about whether it's been moved by people, whether earth moving machines have come along and completely moved things around. They brought rocks from somewhere else. And uh, I'm showing you these because we can have a lot of confidence that these rocks are in place. 
these trees are at least 200 years old. A tree just like this one had fallen down, it was cut in half, I counted more than 200 tree rings. So we're confident that these trees are at least 200 years old and enmeshed in the roots of them are these river rounded pebbles, cobbles, and small boulders. Here's a mason's hammer or a rock hammer for scale. And these cobbles, boulders, rounded pebbles, they're all sandstones. None of them are granites or metamorphic rocks derived from Canada because the Monongahela River drainage is from the south, not from the north. It was not draining the area where there were glacial deposits uh, and, and rocks carried from Canada. So here's some of the evidence that, uh, that uh, there's a, a river terrace in that flat area. And th this is not new with me. Uh, geologists have known about these uh, rounded cobbles on uh, this terrace for uh, a very long time. But I'm happy to be able to show you the evidence. Okay. We'll show a few more points of interest in the excursion that we maybe haven't shown yet. Um, and to introduce those, uh, here's a geologic map of the excursion area. There's Emlinton uh, on the left. Uh, the different symbols on this are different colors and patterns or different rock layers. Um, there's where Rockland Furnace is located. And here's the Vanport limestone. This blue-green color indicates where the Vanport limestone is an outcrop at the surface. And uh, as I mentioned, the top, on top of the Vanport is an iron ore that was used in uh, Rockland Furnace and other furnaces. So you can see it was very handy to the furnace. And there were other uh, Vanport limestone outcrops on the other side of the valley. Another map made at the same time, these were published in 1911, shows oil wells in the area. This is Emlinton. Remember, I showed you a picture of oil wells in a, a square pattern of four, and then there was a fifth. Um, there aren't that many oil wells shown in this map. Uh, the photograph was decades before this. So some of those, many of those wells probably were abandoned uh, before 1911. So I, I don't think this map shows all the wells that existed, but it gives you an idea of where the oil fields were and while the wells were very common. I'm going to show you an orange cascade that you can see at the level of the uh, bike path where the railroad used to be here in the middle of the orange circle. It cascades down from a spring part of the way up this hillside. Um, and I think that spring comes from an abandoned shallow oil well. And I'll show you that, that too. So here's Rockland Furnace uh, that I mentioned, operated from 1832 to either 1856 or 59, a 24 or 27 year period. It's estimated to have produced something like 800 tons of iron a year using that uh, iron ore that I mentioned, limestone from the Vanport, and charcoal. Charcoal was used at the fuel at this, as a fuel at this time. Um, and it's estimated that each furnace used something like an acre of wood per year to make charcoal. Trees would be cut down, gathered up, uh, burned uh, uh, with uh, leaves and dirt on top of them so they don't burn completely, they form charcoal. And then the charcoal was carted off to the, um, to the uh, furnace. But they used a lot of charcoal and they used a lot of trees, about an acre a year. This map shows uh, the locations of iron furnaces in Venango County with the Rockland furnace circled in red. And uh, the gray squares on this are uh, to give an idea of the area of forest that would have been cut down to support each of these furnaces. So, each furnace uh, consumed about an acre of woods per year. So that's about a square mile in two years, rounding, rounding a little bit, uh, about a square mile in two years, or the 24 years of the Rockland furnace operation, maybe something like 12 square miles. That's the area of this gray rectangle. So you can picture the woods that would have been cut down and burned to support these iron furnaces if they went for 20 years or so each. And these furnaces uh, stopped operating for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they ran out of wood, sometimes they ran out of iron ore, sometimes they operated until there were railroads came in and there were much uh, better sources of iron ore, much richer sources of iron ore from elsewhere uh, and that iron was brought into the region. 
But this gives you an idea of the deforestation that uh, was almost certainly occurring as these uh, furnaces were operating. I mentioned the Orange Cascade. I climbed up to the source of it. Uh, it's, uh, the cascade is coated on the bottom with orange iron oxide. And the water coming out of the spring at the top is perfectly clear. And then after the water comes out, the iron oxide precipitates. This looks a lot like acid mine drainage. Uh, it it's, looks the same, really. Uh, most acid mine drainage, um, it uh, precipitates iron oxide, this orange. Sometimes it precipitates aluminum oxide, which is a white milky color instead, but usually iron oxide. And it looks just like this. But another source of this type of water with lots of, uh, uh, lots of chemicals in it uh, from the rocks underground, another source of this can be abandoned oil wells. A colleague at Penn State and her students, uh, Sue Brantley, has studied a number of these in uh, Pennsylvania, abandoned oil wells and waters that are coming out of them. And they found that some of them look just like this. They precipitate iron oxide. And this is an area of oil wells, not coal mining. And I think that this is an abandoned shallow old oil well that wasn't uh, plugged. There are a bunch of other springs uh, that feed water across the trace of the uh, Allegheny River Trail that aren't this orange. Some are a little bit orange, some aren't, aren't orange at all. And I think some of those also come from abandoned oil wells. Um, they don't all have the same water composition. And water that comes out of abandoned mines uh, is acid mine drainage. Um, when a, a mine has been abandoned for something like 100 years, it's thought uh, that it can, the water in the mine can use up all the available minerals and dissolve them. So that really the water that's coming out after a long time of flowing, like 100 years of flowing, uh, it might lose its acid uh, composition and stop precipitating iron. I've seen this happen in uh, acid mine drainage um, near where I live in Pittsburgh on Mount Washington. Uh, there's a cascade that was orange, now it's clear, and the mining there uh, happened more than 100 years ago. So I'm confident that this can happen, and it's, it's written in the literature uh, that that's a, a feature of abandoned mine drainage. So, Surely these uh, oil wells could do the same thing. Okay, a couple other points of interest beyond Orange Cascade. Uh, the Rockland Tunnel, uh, we talked about during, when we talked about history and uh, near the uh, uh, Rockland Furnace is Freedom Falls. And then uh, the turnaround point is a cobble bar along the side of the Allegheny. There's the Rockland Tunnel. It has a curve in it, so you can't see all the way through from the end. Uh, you really need headlights uh, to go through this tunnel. Uh, but you can see daylight behind you until you come to the curve, then you can see daylight ahead. So you can always see daylight somewhere, <laughs> but you do need a headlight to be able to navigate it. Again, this was opened in uh, 1916. I think it was under construction in 1915. There are Freedom Falls. Uh, uh, a, uh, a Mississippian series of thin sandstones that are resistant to erosion and shales clay rich that aren't resistant to erosion. That, that gives us the waterfall, the, that alternation of rock layers. And it's a, a lovely spot. Freedom Falls and uh, uh, the furnace, as I understand it, they're on private land. So we're lucky to be able to go there. Um, leave no trace is definitely in effect for us here. And we want to be uh, extra careful, uh, including as, as uh, relates to safety, as we visit Freedom Falls and Rockland Furnace, which, by the way, we'll have to uh, hike from the trail uh, uh, to be able to access. We'll walk up a dirt and gravel road, uh, uphill for half a mile or so, and then uh, down to the furnace and falls and return. This is the cobble bar, uh, the planned turnaround point. And, uh, these round cobbles carried by the Allegheny River during periods of high flow uh, have a variety of rock types. Most of them are sandstones, but some of them, like the one shown in the lower right, are high-grade metamorphic rocks carried by glaciers from Canada, washed into the river system, and carried down the river. Also on this cobble bar are 
big shells from freshwater mussels, like the one that I'm holding in the upper right. Um, this mussel shell is as big and thick as a surf clam from the beach on the Atlantic Ocean. It's a really robust shell. Uh, this, the Allegheny River here is a uh, national wild and scenic river. There are tens of species of freshwater mussels here. It's a, an especially diverse uh, assemblage in this area of freshwater mussels. And it's pretty cool to see these amazing, huge freshwater mussels, mussel shells. So that's the cobble bar. And hopefully the river will be low enough uh, that we're able to walk away from the trail out to the cobble bar and have a look. So those are the uh, materials I plan to share with you. Um, I hope you enjoy the excursion on the Allegheny River Trail, whether you're coming with us on the Venture Outdoors excursion on October 16th or another time. And we'll stop the recording.